Okay, man, episode eight. Hell yeah. Just because we're not doing the live streams doesn't mean I'll be skipping the episode. Let's talk about everything involving the anti-life equation, golden glider, and the return of our favorite talking plant, Frank. All right, guys, Brent here back with variants cover all things Marvel, DC, Lord of the Rings, anime, gaming, Star Wars, and more. This time, Kite Man, episode eight, just right. Hell yeah. And let's take a quick moment to honor Lance Riddick, the fantastic actor and human being who brought Lex Luthor to life in this series. And without further ado, let's get back into the episode. Let's look. This episode picks up right where we left off after the sexiest villain alive award where Bane was robbed. Look, he was robbed. I don't know how else to explain it. Bane was just robbed. We start off with Kite Man and Golden Glider on the run from Helen Villigan and Lex Luthor, who are rightfully after the anti-life equation because both of them are going to try and do everything in their darndest to ensure that they're going to take that next step up in the villain ladder to where they can put themselves amongst, you know, Dark Side, who we saw earlier on this season is going to be a prominent figure. I know that there's been a couple of episodes since we've seen him, but to just say he's not going to be coming back in any capacity would be entirely wrong. Giving him the anti-life equation, though, would just, you know, very much simplify who's going to be the ruler of Earth, bow down to about a complete understanding that he will be in charge. So with Helen and Lex, we have a better chance of survival. Unfortunately, the briefcase is op, op for op is literally working optimally. See, this is what happens when live streams happen late at night. Is now operating much like the One Ring from Lord of the Rings. Well, it's giving you immense power, giving you immense control, and be able to put you in the situation you want to be in. It is also slowly corrupting Golden Glider's mind. If you want something, the briefcase is speaking to that deepest and darkest, most carnal desire, and ensuring that at that time, things will be continue to be thought out in that manner. She wants desperately to be with her mother, so the briefcase is like, hey, I can offer you everything you want your mom. I can offer you all these moments, these deep, tender touchings, a improvement upon our relationship together, and ultimately all this power and control that you ultimately seek because you've never had it in your life to the umpteenth degree. Which, of course, hook, line, sinker, golden glider, while a good individual at heart, falls directly for the power play because why not? This is just something that tends to happen throughout and has tons of characters, heroes, and people of many, many natures just kind of brought upon because, look, people always want something. The only person that apparently doesn't want something is our boy Kite Man, or as the series referred to him throughout most of this episode, is Chuck. Chuck kind of just wants golden glider, and he's like, look, I went beast mode. I went wrong. I don't ever want to go down this road again. There's nothing I want. I don't want powers. I don't want my kite. I just want to be with Glider, and I want to make things work. She never gave up on me, so why in the world would I give up on her? Which is Admiral. It's very touching. You know, typical kite man. He's a good dude in a bad situation and just trying to make the most of what's going on here. As the episode continues to unravel, we see that the book, the Book of Fables, from Fable Queen, or the Queen of Fables, I should say, ultimately opens up, Goldilocks pops on out, and as we all remember, not so fondly, she is the person who's most picky in the entire world. This chair is not right, this too soft, too hard, just right. Too cold, too hot, just right. Has to continue to go through this formula, left, right, and center, where she is teaching Bane a valuable lesson. Because Bane was just like, straight up like, hey, look, he got an invite from Lex Luthor and Helen Villigan to kind of be the mole and go on and get Kite Man out, which he probably unknowingly would have done. Bless his heart, he's not exactly the most intelligent of beings. However, Goldilocks throughout this episode kind of teaches Bane that maybe it's okay to be particular. It's okay not to settle. You need to be someone who's trying to achieve exactly what you think you deserve and never settle for less. A lesson that Bane has never perfectly picked up upon. He's kind of been verbally bullied, less physically bullied just due to his size than most people would be. And luckily, due to the most people in the society, Bane is someone with good temperament. He's very calm. He's not very physically assertive. Because as we've seen, when Bane gets physically assertive, 
things kind of tend to get done really quickly, and he tends to assert himself as one of the strongest and most broken characters in this universe. Albeit, you know, it's DC, there will be stronger individuals, just looking at the spoof series as what it is. The writing has continued to be solid. We continue to see development in our characters. The jokes and gags aren't too ridiculous over the top. Sure, we had floaties in this one that resembled the male region, but that's about as over the top as we've gotten the entirety of this season other than our boy Mo, who's now once more back with the Queen of Fables. They seem to have this love-hate relationship akin to, like, Lizelle and your origin character. If you played Baldur's Gate 3, you understand. Well, Lizelle literally meets you and is like, you suck, you're just kind of this weird ball of flesh, I'm not really into that. But over time, as she like, kind of gets to know you a little bit and you have a couple arguments, then she's like, I need you, I want you, I want to make this thing happen. And then they have a very carnal relationship at first mo and queen of fables seem to be moving in that capacity rather fast they even though they've continued to argue and while mo finally gets licked out of the honey layer that the insect queen left him in which i don't know if she insect queen is either with us or no longer just in this picture entirely mo is now free but was encased in honey so the goldie not goldie queen of fables had three bears summoned, you know, go along with the old deluxe, and lick the honey off of Mo to ensure he'd eventually get out, which he did not consent to, so we have to go ahead and put that little banner up there. Ultimately, Kite Man checks into a spa run by Frank the Plant from Poison Ivy, who has got some comeuppance as a spa and party resort, but got primo deal on the land because it's directly by a nuclear silo. So they go ahead and hang out there. Ultimately, Golden Glider has a moment because a bunch of girls are having a bachelorette party. Things get a little bit raunchy. They mistake Kite Man for a stripper because who wouldn't see someone in spandex around a bachelorette party and automatically assume stripper? I'm just saying, two and two connected. I'm not really blaming the mojitos on that one. It just kind of makes sense. Superheroes kind of look like strippers. It needs to be discussed. But again, you know, underwear on the inside, underwear on the outside. Either way, you're walking around in tights and broad daylight. It's not necessarily the best of looks overall. So Golden Glider overreacts because of the anti-life equation and starts causing absolute havoc, which Frank then turns on them and turns them into Helen Villigan. He's like, look, I'm a plant. I go where the sun shines. And right now the sun shines on them. I'm going to make sure I put them in my lot with them, hope for the absolute best. So Frank, we trusted you, my friend, but clearly it was the wrong ploy. Never trust talking plants, which, you know, you think a couple movies made about that. We would definitely understand where we're going with this. As the episode then progresses, Golden Glider is torn between being the woman she wants to be for her mom, that daughter that she's always strived to be, and somebody who's the best girlfriend she could possibly be for Chuck. And as things continue to play out, they ultimately come to a head where they're being attacked by Helen Villigan on top of the silos. Ultimately, Chuck, through the power of seduction, is able to go ahead and make you know, Golden Glider changed her mind and dropped the briefcase into the silo, causing a giant reaction, which wiped out significant members of that general area. So Frank's going to have new land to develop, completely flat, but barren of all life. So good luck with him. He survived the blast because he went in the pool, which somehow that trick works. It's kind of like the fridge thing during the blast that they show in, like, the Indiana Jones movies. You're like, I don't know how this works, but somehow it does. So, okay. I'm not a science guy. Never claimed to be. And then, as we see the Golden Glider and Chuck are like, cool, we're finally free. We've moved forward. We don't have to worry about this anymore. Only to find out, once and for all, the briefcase is still very much undamaged. And now they'll have to figure out how to get rid of it. And ultimately, they ended up with the pun that we've been kind of waiting on for about eight episodes, where they said, hell yeah, hell no, is finally uttered. How that will impact everyone moving forward involving the anti-life equation. I'm seeing Dark Side in our future and seeing how he's going to ultimately abscond with this and go, make off with his daughter to go ahead and start their reign of tyranny in the best way possible for them. As I'll beat, if you've listened to this for about nine and a half minutes now, be sure to hit that lovely red subscribe button. Clearly, there's something you liked in the breakdown of the content. If not, likes and dislikes are always appreciated. I've been Brent for Geek Variants. I'll see you in the next one.